remain standing as we begin with our worship this morning. Arise, my soul, arise. Would you stand with me? Classic old hymn, Arise, my soul, arise. Arise, my soul, arise. Shake off thy guilty fears. The Father in heaven, we're grateful that we can come to you and cry out, and we are always conscious that it's because you have reconciled us to you through the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, and so coming into your presence is a privilege that we enjoy because of your kindness to us. And today we ask that in our time together that your Holy Spirit will convict us and help us to be strengthened in our understanding of who uh, you are so that we might be more faithful in service. Lord, we pray for some of our church family today who are traveling, and I pray you'll give them a good weekend, and even as they enjoy other services or perhaps watch online, I pray that you would give them guidance as well. Thank you again for your kindness. Bless our time together, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. The next song we'll sing uh, is Hiding in Thee. And it's written by a man, gentleman named William Cushing. And he says this about the hymn. He says, It must be said of this hymn that it was the outgrowth of many tears, many heart conflicts, and soul yearnings. He goes on to say, The history of many battles is behind it. And when the hymn was published, the verse that was, was written at the top was Psalm 31.2, which says, Be my rock of refuge a strong fortress to save me. And I don't know where you are this morning, perhaps some of the things that he said you can identify with, but the verses of the hymn talk about where you are, and then the chorus is a prayer. So I invite you to pray that with me as we sing, Hiding in Thee. O oh, safe to the rock that is higher than I, my soul in its conflicts and sorrows would fly. So sinful, so weary, thine, thine would I be. Thou blessed rock of ages, I'm hiding in thee. Hi Hiding in thee 
in the calm of the noontide, in sorrow's lone hour, in times when temptation casts o'er me its power, in the tempest of life on its wide heaving sea. Thou blessed rock of ages, I'm hiding in Thee, hiding in Thee, hiding in Thee. Thou blessed rock of ages, I'm hiding. How oft in the conflict, when pressed by the foe, I have fled to my refuge and breathed out my woe. How often when trials like sea billows roll, have I hidden in thee, O thou rock of my soul, hiding in thee, hiding in thee, thou blessed rock of ages, I'm high. Wonderful singing this morning. Just a couple announcements I want to go over. Uh, today, two, well, two of them dealing with our discussion groups. Last week, we had new discussion groups uh, that were created. And so if you were not here two weeks ago when we discussed that or last week with our first meeting and you're not sure what group you're in, the lists are out on uh, the information desk or in the foyer. And if you don't see your name there, it may just be because the way we did our groups this time. Don't worry, we didn't forget you. Uh, it's just how we did the group. So if you're not on that list, you're not sure where to go, you can check with me or Pastor Wright and we'll help direct you to a group. And along those lines today, we do have our discussion fellowship groups today. So a diff little bit different format. So there'll be no evening service tonight. Uh, so keep that in mind. And then also one correction in here, mainly for the Academy family. Down at the bottom where it says the picture day for Tuesday the 10th, that should say the 13th. All right, so it's not the it's not Tuesday. That's Friday. Uh, for that, just wanted to make sure that the families were aware of that. Uh, that the correction for that there, Pastor Wright. Would you mind getting the clicker for me? Because I'm going to clicker. So, <clears throat> thank you. So, um, in your bulletin, there is. Uh, um, Another, there's the blue box, and in there, that's some things about the discussion groups um, as well. And a couple of weeks ago, um, after the morning service, I did uh, a discussion group discussion, which was basically I had you answer a series of questions for me. And sometimes people will say, well, why didn't you tell us that and tell us the questions? Sometimes I don't want you to think about the questions, and I don't want you to talk about them. I just want to know, off the top of your head, what are you thinking? What's your answer to that? And so I know sometimes if you would think it through, you'd get a few more answer, answers. Um, but we wanted to get some good input on the discussion groups. And so I thought you might enjoy seeing some of the responses that we got from that and uh, how that will help us in, in making some de decisions in the future. So uh, there were five questions. And the first question was, do you attend or not attend? And if you attend the discussion groups afterward, what do you like best about the discussion groups? What's your favorite part of it, or what do you like best? And there were a number of things that were written down. And so what I've done is you'll see answers. And if you see a number after it, it means that there were that many people who put that answer down. So if you see an answer in seven, that means seven people gave that answer. And of course, I had to combine um, and, and filter things a little bit uh, just to put them in the same categories. But let me just list them, and I'm not going to linger on these, but uh, if for the people who attended, what did they like best? 
37 of the people said that they liked uh, just the fellowship and the fact that, that they get to meet people that they don't normally sit with. And there were a lot of comments with that that people just really enjoy uh, interacting with people that you don't normally interact with. And that's very true in our church, even though it's not a, a large church. If somebody sits up here all the time and you sit back there, you don't get to know them. And so this gives us an opportunity to know people. Um, then number two, they like expanding the topic of the sermon. Um, and number three, there were seven people that just put down, I just like them. Um, and uh, small groups create discussion. Uh, several people said that they enjoy getting to study the scripture together. Uh, number six, there were people who said they like to hear different viewpoints. And one person wrote, uh, learn where I may be wrong. Well, that's a good spirit from somebody. Um, then there were, were a number seven, there were three very honest people. I come, but I don't like it. <laughs> well, I appreciate knowing that. <laughs> uh, it's a great learning environment. Somebody liked that they were informal, uh, personal reflection and application. And then somebody put just being able to ask questions about the sermon. And so some good information there, and, and it does affirm for me on that first one that we're accomplishing one of the major objectives, and that is getting to know other people in our church and interacting with them. Here was a second question, and I was very interested to, to see the answers to this. If you were, they were here this week, and if they don't attend, if you don't come to the discussion group, why don't you come? And, and that's a great question. And so there were, I actually have fewer people that, that don't attend than do, but a lot more answers to that. So here were some of the things that came up when we put the answers down. Uh, work um, was, was one of the answers, and I should have put medical reasons as the first one because there were two people that answered that, that and, and I actually know both of those people and it is legitimate things that they can't stay. Um, Number three, uh, somebody said, I prefer Sunday school with my own age. Um, I would rather have a teacher. Um, number five, there are a few people who dominate the discussion. So I don't know. And let me encourage you, one of the reasons we, we rotate the groups is because you will not always be there with the same people. And so you might have that in a group and then the next one you wouldn't. Um, somebody said they just didn't find it beneficial. and It had gotten stale. That's a, a good answer. Uh, rushed. I don't know if they mean the discussion group is rushed or they're rushed, but I think they mean the group is rushed, and we'll come back to that one. Um, somebody said, I, I have work to do at my house or at home, um, and so I need to get that done. Uh, leaders rehearse the sermon rather than other topics. Um, and one of the things I did learn is these were, were people who have, have perhaps come a little bit, and they have some reason that they don't like them. Uh, they don't, number 10, I don't find it as profitable as the sermon. Number 11, I'm not interested in being judged by others who don't know me uh, and to allow non-participation without pestering. Um, I, I would encourage whoever that is. I doubt that people are judging you. Uh, sometimes you, you feel like people are thinking something and they're probably not thinking what you think they're thinking. So think about it. Okay. <laughs> Uh, number 12, the weekend is limited. Half a day is enough. Half a day would be 12 hours. Um, yeah, I, 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 I would like to talk to that person too because I'm, I'm not sure. Anyway, it's 29 more minutes. Um, and then number 13, let people talk about the subjects they want. Um, and, and that's... That's really, that, that would be interesting, but it's not really the purpose of the discussion group to do that. Number three, I just ask for this. Do you have any general suggestions? And, and so again, I enjoyed some of those. Um, divide based on age groups was, was one of the top answers. Now, let me, uh, let me talk to you about that because this is something that's not new. We discuss this regularly uh, when we have our, our leaders together and deacons and trustees and people um, and you'd say, why don't you put all the teenagers in one group and let them discuss? Well, we have. Uh, we have had a session where we did that, but a lot of times we do spread the teenagers out, and there are two things that we want to, two reasons we do that. Uh, one is because there is a biblical teaching that older people are to teach younger. And so 
uh, when you read through the scripture, you as, as older people are to take those younger people under your wing. A young, an older lady taking a younger a lady under her wing, including a teenager, and helping them. Older men uh, get to know these young men and teach them. And so we feel like there's a little bit of a biblical principle there. The second thing we have to be careful of is you don't want to pool ignorance. Uh, you have all the teenagers giving the answers. How many answers do they actually know? Well, if you ask them, <laughs> they know a lot. And so we want to be careful. You, of course, put a discussion group leader in there. So there are pros and cons to that. We will actually do that again. We'll have a group of just teenagers. But realize that that is something we do discuss fairly often. And we want the older people influencing our younger people. And so make sure you take them under your wing when we do that. Number two was fewer questions. They can't finish the list. And you will see this come up in several of the answers. So I did want to talk about that as well. I already know that. Um, I want you to think about it from the other side. This morning, you're only going to have four questions, but several of them have sub-questions under them. And so when Pastor Rogers does his group and, and he asks uh, question number two, and I believe it has four things underneath it, he may, in his group, get to the third one, and that's all they'll get done. Uh, I know the questions today, and you could talk about these for a long time. Somebody else may get all the way through it. It is extremely difficult to write a discussion sheet that you know everybody's going to spend the same amount of time on. And so if you don't finish the discussion sheet, that actually is kind of the intent I don't want you to get to the end of the discussion and not have anything to discuss. Uh, in school, when you buy curriculum, you often see that a curriculum has way more than you'll get done in a year. That's the way it should be. Because if you have a class that's doing really well, then you can do more. If you can't get through all the curriculum, that's okay because they plan for that. And so those discussion sheets uh, don't feel like you have to get through everything in the discussion sheets. Uh, they're designed that way, and they have to be designed that way because not every discussion leader is going to deal with them the same way. And so I'm glad you brought that up because that is something that I have not uh, told you and, and should have made clear. Number three on here, uh, some leaders get preachy and don't allow discussion, so let's be careful with that. Uh, make them longer. Um, and I think they make, mean make the discussion group longer. And that kind of goes back to question two. Just realize that I would love for you to get through every question. I work hard on those, and so I'd love for you to answer each one. But you may not have time to get all of them, and that's okay. Um, number five, study something other than the sermon. We have done that, and we'll do that again, actually. Uh, when we first started them, we did um, Growing in Grace, I think, which was just a basics study, and we will do something like that again. Uh, fo focus the study sheet less on reviewing the sermon and more on the application. Um, we try to do that, and that's a good uh, observation. Um, I don't know that I understand number seven, so if this is yours, I, I need to know a little more what you're thinking here. Make the discussion handout more precise, and I, I don't know if I, I'm, I'm not sure what you mean there, so if that's yours, help me out a little bit. Um, somebody else felt that it poses a danger, breeds disagreements, always a possibility, and that's why we have the discussion leaders in there. We want to be careful of that. Um, keep a general discussion not too structured. Again, I, I would have to talk to that person a little bit more. Um, hand out the discussion sheet the week before. Um, if we have topics, we can do that. When we're discussing the sermon, sometimes that's difficult to do. Um, those of you who have preached, sometimes you refine what you're doing the week before. And so I often will write the, the discussion sheet either on Friday, Saturday, or this morning, Sunday morning. Um, and so sometimes you need to know exactly what's going to be in the message before you can do that. Uh, Eleven, uh, a good suggestion, a virtual group or an online message board. Uh, maybe there's some people who would be interested in that. Um, somebody else said make the groups five to six people. Um, if you have five to six people that you know are going to be there every week, that works. Uh, but we've had to go larger with the groups because we don't have the same people here all the time. 
And then 13, it's too simplistic. And I'm not sure, again, somebody put that, but I don't know exactly what that means. And so if you want to explain that more, feel free to do that. Um, other general suggestions, they love that the groups rotate, and then the next person says, with groups changing all the time, I never feel comfortable joining in. Um, so again, finding a balance. Uh, we try to leave them together for 12 to 15 weeks, and there are weeks in there where we don't meet, and so they go longer than that, but that's what we've kind of settled on there. Somebody else, meet weekly at 6 p.m. Uh, in a home. Uh, those will be more like home groups, and, and your group is welcome to do that. Um, discussion group once a month with fellowship groups. Um, and then number 18, I like the discussion groups with the entire church together. Um, I do too. I like having big discussion groups, and, and I enjoy that. But I think sometimes the smaller ones do help get more people involved. And then there were two others I couldn't fit on there. Uh, stick to start and end times, and, and we do want our groups to do that. And so make sure that we, we aren't, um, we're ending when we need to. The big problem right now is getting started when we need to. When we were in the activity building, everybody went to the table, you pretty much started. Now we've got a lot of people moving around. So try to get there and get those groups started if you can. And I love number 20. This is probably my favorite of all of them. Snacks. Yeah. <laughs> A couple of other questions, and these were just <clears throat> tallying them. I asked the question, do you prefer Sunday school or discussion groups? Now remember, when we had Sunday school, our attendance was dropping. And so when you take something away, people look back and go, oh, I really wish we had that. And uh, so when I asked, do you prefer Sunday school or discussion groups, 44% um, said they preferred the Sunday school. 49% said they uh, preferred the, the discussion groups, and then there was 7%, that <clears throat> doesn't add up, does it? Yeah. Um, go by the numbers, there's something wrong there. Yeah, 80, that would be 90, yeah, it wouldn't, okay, that's right, yep. So 44% said they liked Sunday school, 49% said they liked the discussion groups, and then this question was tainted a little bit by some people, because in some of the, the meetings that I've already had, I've talked about having Sunday school part of the time and then other times having the discussion group. And so probably those people have already heard that discussion. And so 7% said, yeah, I'd, I'd rather do a, a mixture of both. And that was kind of the intent. Um, over the summer, I was going to go back and do some Sunday school classes. But then when we moved to the auditorium, I felt like it was a bad time to stop having the discussion groups to make sure we knew how to... Uh, how to make it work. And so at some point we are going to do some things like that and I don't have that uh, definitively scheduled yet. Uh, number five, uh, would you rather have the discussion group at 9.15 a.m. or 9.16 a.m.? Um, and that would essentially be saying, would you rather come to a discussion group before the service or would you rather come uh, have a discussion group after the service? Now, obviously, if we did that, I would have to change the discussion sheet a little bit. I, I know that. And somebody put on there, how can you discuss the sermon if it's before? I know that. Yeah. Um, and so here were the, the answers to that. 63% uh, of the people said, I'd rather have it after like we have it now. 37% said they'd rather have it before. Now you say, well, that's pretty overwhelming. It is, but realize that, but that that means one out of every three people said I'd rather come early. And so there actually, in my mind, there are some possibilities that we'll have some discussion groups early, um, but I'll have to work out some details on that. And, and I don't know if we can do both or not, but it is something that we might consider down the road. And then number six was thoroughly tainted because... Uh, a lot of people just by virtue of the answer still didn't really answer based on for the sake of the discussion groups would it be worth moving back to the activity building not do you want to move back to the activity building which is how a lot of people answered it and so I don't feel like this this answer was uh, if I were back in my statistics class I would have to throw this question out because it was too tainted um, and the, the, the answer was 
40% said that I would rather move back to the, to the activity building, 60% said stay in the auditorium. But again, I think a lot of people were saying, do I like the service better in the activity building or in the auditorium? And that's not what I ask you. <laughs> so, but I do understand your answer um, to that. Um, so, those are the answers. Now, what are we going to do with those? Well, what that does is that helps me in doing some planning. Uh, and and uh, I've mentioned this before, but information is critical. Uh, sometimes I can go by what I hear from people, but I don't hear from everyone. And that gives you an opportunity to say, all right, here's what I think, and then gives me an opportunity to sit down with all of those papers and read through them and get a, an idea from you of what's going through your mind, what do you like, what do you not, li not like, and there were several suggestions in there that are really good suggestions and things that we can put to use. And so let me thank you again just for taking the time to do that. And you won't see any immediate changes. And the reason is that we have things already laid out for several, um, I, I was going to say weeks, but really months. And so probably more toward the first of the year, you will see some of those things actually being implemented because we have to plan things like that when we're going to change them. And so your information will help and it will make a difference for us. And so uh, don't feel like that if you don't see anything change in the discussion group in the next uh, six weeks that ah, nobody paid attention to it. We are paying attention to it, but we can't really use the information for a little while. So if you're one of those people that, that made a comment and I said, I, I'm not sure I understand, if you want to explain it more, feel free to let me know. Um, and if you have other information you, th you thought of afterward, uh, feel free to talk to me, send me an email, and uh, we can still get that uh, information in there and it'll help us to do some planning. All right? Um, I was going to say any questions, but I don't know that we want to do that this morning. So uh, ask me questions later if you have questions. All right, our song of the month is Worthy of Praise. Great song. And so I'm going to ask Sam to come back and we're going to sing that. Would you join me in standing one more time this morning as we sing Worthy of Praise? Let's all stand together, Worthy of Praise. My heart.
Let me have our ushers go ahead and come, and this morning uh, we'll pray especially for David Minnick. Uh, he is a missionary, uh, one of our missionaries in Australia, doing a great job over there. And then also for Luke Shope, who's just across town at Lighthouse Baptist Church, uh, recently became the senior pastor there, and things are going great for him, and so let's pray for their ministry. And then also for uh, Senator Mark Warner, uh, and as always, we pray for people around him just to influence him uh, as well. Todd, come pray for us, please. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, do uh, thank you this morning for uh, just the opportunity that you give us to worship and that uh, you continue to help us just to grow in our faith and help us just to acknowledge you in all that we do. And we praise you for our church, how, how wonderful you've been to our church. Uh, so many wonderful believers here uh, willing to share the gospel and uh, just praise you for our leadership, how, how good it is to have a wonderful pastor and, and men uh, like our assistant pastors that have uh, just been so good. And we just praise you for that and ask for your continued blessing upon us and upon these people that I've mentioned, uh, that you would just encourage them in the faith. And this morning, uh, we lift up these men that, uh, that we know so well. David Minnick, who's been here many times, and just praise you for him and his family, how uh, just moving back to Australia and, and uh, promoting the gospel. Father, being an ambassador for you, how wonderful that is. And just pray that you would uh, continue to encourage him and help him to plant uh, and then, Father, that you can water all of that he's planted. Thank you for him, and, and uh, just pray that you would continue to help him to see success in the ministry, and that he would just continue to be strengthened in his family as well. Uh, also, for Luke uh, Chope at Lighthouse, we, we thank you for their church, thank you for their, their stance, uh, how they stand for you, and pray that you would just continue to help them to be an encouragement in this area uh, as we see the, the nation coming apart. Father, we pray for a revival. We pray that uh, there'd be other like churches, like Lighthouse, like Keystone, like Emmanuel, uh, that, that will stand in the gap, that will stand firm in, in what they believe and, Father, draw others to you. And, Father, for, for Mark Warner, we thank you for him. Um, just ask you to put, uh, as Pastor said, people around him that, that uh, have a knowledge of the gospel that can lead him and direct him and help him just to uh, understand, Father, who you are and, and what your son has done for us and how uh, much of a blessing that is in our life. And Father, we do praise you this morning. We ask for your grace and your mercy. Ask for you to bless this offering as we take it and use it for your kingdom, in Christ's name, amen.
Our scripture reading for today is 1 Thessalonians 5. 1 Thessalonians 5, and we'll read the first 11 verses. 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 1. But of the times and seasons, brethren, ye have no need that I write unto you, for yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. For when they shall say, Peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. But ye, brethren, are not in darkness, that that day should overtake you as a thief. Ye are all the children of light, and the children of the day. We are, not of, we are not of the night, nor of darkness. Therefore let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. For they that sleep, sleep in the night, and they that be drunken, be dr- are drunken in the night. But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and for a helmet of the hope of salvation. For God hath not pointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, that whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with him. Wherefore, comfort yourselves together, and edify one another, even as also ye do. And all God's people said, Amen. Let me ask you to go ahead and turn back to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, um, and then... Just move forward one page to 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, and we're going to be in both of those this morning. And if you are three years old through the third grade and would like to go to our junior church program this morning, let me go ahead and let you make your way out the back doors, and the workers will direct you from there. I mentioned we have several people that are traveling this morning and uh, uh, some of them are are music folks. I appreciate just a lot of people who are involved in music and so I appreciate the people who continue to help us with that and be involved in it. Um, Christy is in Marietta, Georgia. I've added another grandchild. So I have another boy. Julia had a boy this on Friday. Uh, His name is Harlan, Harlan Kyle. So I'm going to have to get used to that, Harlan. Yeah. Um, So she's there um, the rest of this week, and then uh, several other folks, since we have Columbus Day Monday, they're traveling as well. So we're actually starting today into 2 Thessalonians. If you've been here for a while, uh, last year uh, we started in, or we went through 1 Thessalonians, five chapters in Thessalonians. A lot of it deals with uh, the Lord's return, and Paul was specifically answering some questions for them. And so as he answered those questions, uh, they were equipped for some of the things that were coming. Uh, but when you come to Second Thessalonians, if you read verses 1 and 2, it says, Paul and Sylvanius, or you might have Silas there, um, Paul and Sylvanius and Timotheus unto the church of the Thessalonians in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace unto you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I'm going to stop there. Uh, and that's as far as we're going to get in 2 Thessalonians today. Next week we'll actually pick it up in verse 3 and we'll go all the way through verse 12, do almost the entire chapter other than the first two verses. But I want to take some time and do an introduction and introduce the theme um, of the book today, and not simply in a lecture mode or in a, uh, a college class mode, but I want you to see what motivated Paul to write a second letter. If he wrote 1 Thessalonians to him, there's always a reason why he follows it up with a second letter. And that's true throughout Scripture. Um, When you have 1 Corinthians, there's a reason that he wrote 2 Corinthians. And same thing with Peter. Uh, He was writing usually to explain more or to elaborate on something or to address a situation that came up because of his first letter. And here in Thessalonians, uh, that last reason was his motivation for writing the second time to the church at Thessalonica. Something had happened as a result of his first letter, and he needed to clear it up. Let me ask you a question. Have you ever been embarrassed by another believer's behavior? 
Have you ever been embarrassed by another believer's behavior? I'm sure as you think about that, that you would think of times that you say, oh boy, I I have, I've been embarrassed by another believer. There have been uh, a handful of times as I have been a believer that I would intentionally distance myself from somebody who called themselves a believer because of their behavior. Either it was wrong, or it was aggressive, or it was something that was just embarrassing to me. They did some things that I wasn't comfortable with, and some things that I felt like were not really biblically accurate, either in the way they were doing or what they were doing. And you could come up with some, some uh, illustrations of that, I sure. I, I'm, I'm sure. In your discussion group today, you're going to enjoy the discussion because it's going to go a little bit further into that, especially dealing with, are you embarrassed because they're obeying the Lord and you're not, or is it something that has crossed a line? And, and you have to figure that out because I don't want to be embarrassed by something that a person ought to be doing. But I I can be embarrassed occasionally because somebody is doing something in a way or doing something that is wrong according to Scripture. I'll give you an illustration of that. Over the course of history, there have been people who have predicted the Lord's coming. Now, I don't mean like us where we say, someday the Lord is coming. And from a pre-tribulational, pre-millennial point of view, I would say that the trumpet's going to sound, the dead in Christ shall rise first, then we which are alive and remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so I believe that there will be a rapture. Uh, It comes from a a Latin word, rapturio, which means snatching away, that God will take his people from this earth. I really believe that's what Paul was teaching in 1 Thessalonians 4. And so I'm predicting that that will happen. But I don't know when. I believe it could be today, tomorrow, a week from now. I believe it could be any time. But through the course of history, there have been people who have come up with the specific date when that's going to happen. And so I use the good old Wikipedia. And Wikipedia actually has, I think it's like three or four pages of the history of this where people have predicted the Lord's coming. Um, there was a, a guy named William Miller. He was actually the, kind of the founder of the Seventh-day Adventist. But he predicted that October 22, 1844 was when the Lord was going to come. Now there were a lot of things going on around that and things that he was talking about. But when it didn't happen, he said, oh, you know, it, it really did. You just didn't know it. Okay, can you explain that? Well, here's what he said. Christ began the second phase of his heavenly ministry by entering the most holy place. Did anybody see that? No? Where's that talked about? Well, I just know it happened. And so he, he, he really, what happened for him was, if you study him, he misapplied biblical prophecies about the sanctuary being rebuilt and biblical prophecies that dealt with other specific things, and he applied them to the second coming, and he came up with this date. Well, that's not the only time it's happened. Some of you are old enough to remember Hal Lindsey. How many of you are familiar with that name? Yeah, some of you would know the name. He's actually still on. He has a podcast where he talks about um, uh, prophecy, and he's still, uh, you can still hear him. I looked him up. Uh, He looks kind of old now. Of course, people look me up now and say he looks kind of old now. Um, But he's still out there. But he wrote a book called The Late Great Planet Earth. Uh, You'll still see it in used bookstores once in a while. Um, and when he wrote this book, uh, he, he predicted that the Lord would come in 1988. And while he didn't uh, really give a specific date the Lord would come, he said the Lord is coming in 1988. And, and as it went on, they kind of came to the exact time it was going to happen. And, and, and I didn't research all the details of it, but, but, but people got really excited about the Lord was going to come in 1988, and it came to 1989. And Hal Lindsey is still on TV and still talking about prophecy. At the same time, there was Edgar uh, Wisenant. And he wrote a book, 88 Reasons Why the Lord is Coming is Going to Come by 1988. I don't know what it was with 1988. Uh, but he sold 4.5 million copies of his book. 
And he was very specific about when he said the, the Lord was coming. Trinity Broadcast Network interrupted their regular programming to tell people how to prepare for the rapture. And then the next day they resumed their regular programming. Now, you and I know that there's a problem with this. There was a church in North Carolina, and I don't know which church did it, but I remember this. They spent the money and took out uh, uh, and put this billboard out. And if it's a little crooked, it's hard to read, but it says that was awkward. And then it quotes uh, part of Matthew 24, 36. No one knows the day or the hour. And I was actually glad they put it up. And it, it uh, was one of those things that, that was, uh, people saw widely. That was awkward. You know, here's somebody quoting or, or predicting the, the day of the Lord. And this was in response to a guy named Harold Camping, who had said very specifically, here is when the Lord is going to come. Matthew 24, 36 says, But of that day and hour no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, nor the Son, but the Father alone. And so when somebody comes out and they say, the Lord is going to come, out, come back on October 15th, 2023, I can kind of tell you he's probably not coming that day because nobody knows the day or hour that he's coming. And this verse is as clear as you can possibly get. And so when somebody predicts this, um, you, you can hear the prediction and people will get excited about it and then you know, the Lord doesn't come and we move on and they just either redo their prediction. That's, that's usually what happens. Oops, I mis miscalculated. Let me redo this and here's when he's really going to come. And then that's happened over and over for some people and people will still follow some of these people. They'll still listen to them. But it's embarrassing. Because here's a world that's watching and they're expecting Jesus to come based upon what this person has said and whoops, he didn't come. And I'm like that billboard, that was awkward. And I would be very careful to distance myself from those people and say, wait, that's not us. But aren't you a Christian? Yeah. Are they a Christian? Maybe. Yeah, I think they claim to be at least. But that's not us. That, that's really awkward. I'm embarrassed by some of those people. And there have been numerous times, as I've said, where there have been situations where somebody has done something or said something where I was embarrassed by what they did. And I would, would intentionally uh, you know, distance myself. I remember one time, Christy's grandfather lived with us, and he was 99 when he died. He got saved later in life, but he was not a, a, a quiet, reserved person. And the great thing was, he would witness to anybody. But we took him to the emergency room once, and, and he's in, the, in there in the hospital, and, and uh, he asked the nurse, he said, so honey, and you know, honey, he would call him that, honey, are you, are you a Christian? And she said, well, no, I'm Jewish. And he said, well, honey, you're going straight to hell. <laughs> I don't know who the man is, I just found him on the street, and we brought him in. You know, that's, that's a little more abrupt than I think the Lord wants you to be. Now, maybe the Lord will use that. Maybe that lady got saved. I don't know. But that's probably not the tactful approach that most of us are going to use to soul winning. And so there are times when somebody says something and you think, wow, that just doesn't seem right. And what you run into when you get into 2 Thessalonians is this. Let me state this as what we would call a fallen condition focus. That is, here's the focus of this book. People who misunderstand or misrepresent biblical teaching sanction behavior inconsistent with Christianity. Now, I want you to grasp that statement because that's going to be a theme of a lot of the book. People who misunderstand or misrepresent, and I believe you're gonna, we're going to be able to make a case where these people didn't really misunderstand it, they intentionally misrepresented it. When they misunderstand or misrepresent biblical teaching, they sanction behavior inconsistent with Christianity. And in making the application to that, what we're going to learn is that there are people who love to 
uh, tweak and twist Scripture just enough so that they can continue to do some of the things that they should not do and feel like the Bible is okay with it. And that includes a lot of things. It includes music, it includes entertainment, it includes activities, it includes alcohol. It includes, I mean, a, an, a, you, you could just keep going with the list. The people who misunderstand or misrepresent biblical teaching, they don't want to know exactly what the Bible teaches on that because they have behavior that they want to be involved in. And it's, it is, as most people would sense, inconsistent with biblical Christianity. So I'm going to change that uh, and put it in the opposite order for us. And so this will be the, the theme or purpose of what we're looking at this morning. Behavior inconsistent with Christianity. When you see someone whose behavior is inconsistent with Christianity, it's a key to discerning misunderstood or misrepresented Bible teaching. So let's make sure you understand that as well. When you see a, a person, a ministry, or you see something that is inconsistent with Christianity. So immediately, I mean like bang, the moment that somebody comes out and says to you, the Lord is coming October 15th, 2023. I'm sure of it. I found it back in Leviticus by adding all the, the first letters of, of the second verse of each chapter. Okay. Immediately, that is behavior that's inconsistent. That you can't do that. You have either misunderstood or misrepresented biblical teaching. And so when I see that, I say, that's wrong. And you have to have a sense of that as a believer. That you look at somebody and you see their behavior. You look at some church and see their behavior. You look at some ministry and see their behavior and say, wait a minute, you're missing something here. There's something that's just not right about what's going on. And so what we find in Thessalonians is an example of that. And the whole, uh, the whole three chapters, it's not a very long book, but three chapters, this is what he's going to deal with, and he's going to try to help them understand that. Now, let me, let me do the boring part uh, of, of uh, an introduction here. So let's get the date of the book so that we get the setting of it a little bit better. If you were to study the New Testament, you would find that, that Paul was converted shortly after Jesus was crucified. We, we don't have exact dates of it, uh, but we know Jesus was crucified somewhere around 33 A.D. Um, that is Anno Domini. It's, it means uh, it's, our, our dating system is based on Jesus. And so Paul was converted somewhere around shortly after Jesus' death. Now, uh, most people think uh, Paul was converted, then he went on missionary journeys. Actually, there's a period of 14 years where he went and studied and grew and worked in a church and became part of a ministry. And then in 47 and 48 A.D., he went on his first missionary journey. And if you've studied Acts, you know what that is. He left the church. He went intentionally to preach the gospel in places where it had not been preached. He was a missionary to the Gentiles, non-Jewish people. And so he went and he took his missionary journey and he planted those churches. He came back and reported to his home church, but was not there long at all. And in 49 through 52, much longer journey, took him several years this time, he took a second journey with the blessing of the church. And he went to, to numerous places and, and he checked on the churches that he had planted to make sure they had leadership, went further all the way over into to some of the areas where he knew nobody had ever preached the gospel, made a big, big loop and came back and, and went to the church at Antioch again and reported on how it went, gave a report to the people who sent him. Then, uh, a few years later, he was actually home for a little while this time, and so home for a couple of years, and then God burdened him again. And he said, I need to go back and check on these churches, and there are other places that I want to preach the gospel as well. And so, 56 through 58, uh, two years roughly, he took his third missionary journey. And this time, he never finished it because, remember, he was arrested, he was sent to Rome. Um, and we know that in 67, nine years later, Paul was martyred in Rome. 
I mean, we, I say we know that. That's As far as we can tell, that's what happened, that he died. He was probably arrested, released, and served in, in ministry for a while, and then he was arrested again, and, and he was put to death. And so here's the, the big picture of Paul's ministry. He was converted, took three really solid missionary journeys, churches were planted, gospel was preached, and then he was martyred um, in 67. So he was a Christian for... Uh, 34 years, and served the Lord faithfully. But when did these things in Thessalonica happen? Well, on the second missionary journey, this is when he went to Thessalonica, and if you remember from our study of 1 Thessalonians, he went into Thessalonica, he preached in the synagogues, and then they threw him out of the synagogue, so he went to another home, and then the Jews came, and, and they ran him out of town. And, and we don't know exactly how long he was there, but in the time he was there, he left a solid church ministry, and he left some people to lead. Well, after he left, he ended up in, in Berea and Athens, and when he was in Athens, he sent Timothy back to check on the church, and Timothy came back to Athens and said, Paul, I have really good news. That church at Thessalonica, it's doing great. And so when Paul writes 1 Thessalonians, he's not writing to get after them about anything. He's writing saying, I am so encouraged by what I heard about your church. Now they had some questions, especially some questions about the second coming of the Lord. And so he answers those questions. And in the process of doing that, he's trying to help them finalize their understanding of eschatology, future things. And so as you come to, to that understanding, this is where we get to the problem. So when you, you think back to 1 Thessalonians, in 1 Thessalonians he expressed his thankfulness and then he did have to defend himself against some slander from some people who, who were just trying to tear the preacher down. He encouraged these people to stand against those, uh, the persecutions and then you're going to face pressure to revert to your pagan standards, your lifestyle that the unsaved people have. You don't live like that. You live like a Christian. You're different from those people. And then he answered these questions about what happens to a Christian if he dies before the Lord's return. Remember that passage? Uh, that the trump's going to sound, the dead in Christ are going to rise first. And he said, hey folks, comfort one another with these words. If somebody in your church dies, God hasn't forgotten about them. He's going to raise them. We're going to see them in heaven. We're all going to see the Lord together. And then finally he comes to the end, and in chapter 5, he deals with the day of the Lord, and he also deals with just some general things. Pray without ceasing, and he, and he goes to that list of things that he talks about. But in this passage, and this is the reason that Chipper read for us this morning, 1 Thessalonians 5, verses 1 through 11. Will you turn back there with me, please? 1 Thessalonians 5, 1 through 11. And in this passage, Paul is dealing with the day of the Lord. Understand that the day of the Lord is not one particular day. Um, he's saying it in the sense of the day of um, um, computers. It was in the, the time of or the day of. It's a period of time. And the Bible uses this phrase from the Old Testament to the New Testament. And so he's talking to them about the day of the Lord. So go back to chapter 5 verse 1. But of the times and the epochs, or the seasons, brethren, you have no need that I write unto you. And the reason they didn't need him to write is because he had talked to them about that in person. He had taught them a lot about that. For yourselves know uh, perfectly, or you, you know full well, that the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night. It comes at a time you don't expect it. And when they shall say, peace and safety, then sudden destruction will come upon them. And as travail or birth pangs upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. But ye, brethren, are not in darkness, that that day should overtake you as a thief. You are all the sons of light, or the children of light, and the sons or children of day. You are not of the night, nor of the darkness." Therefore, let us not sleep. And by that he means, let's not get uh, 
uh, in slumber, where we're just not paying attention. Let's not get that way, as do others, but let us watch and be serious-minded, be sober. For they that sleep, sleep in the night, and they that be drunken, be drunken in the night. But let us, who are of the day, be sober, be serious-minded, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and for an helmet the hope of salvation. Now here's the important phrase that you're going to want to pay attention to in verse 9. For God has not destined us or appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, that whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with him. Wherefore, encourage or comfort yourselves together and edify, build up one another, even as also you are already doing. Now, he finishes this passage the way he finished 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 through 18. Comfort one another with this. This is good news. And the good news is that the day of the Lord is coming, and included in that day of the Lord is the time when Jesus will take the believers away, talked about that in chapter 4, and then God's wrath is going to fall on humanity. And that wrath includes the things that are listed in Revelation, the tribulation period. That time when the Antichrist comes and the beast is set up. And he said, folks, I have good news for you. You're not going to face that. As a matter of fact, back in chapter 1, verse 10, he said, For to wait for his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, which delivers us from the wrath to come. You might think, well, that's the wrath of hell. No, in this book, clearly the wrath is talking about God pouring his wrath out on humanity. And he had taught them that's not going to happen. And so when he talked about the day of the Lord, he made clear to them that there was a time coming. He gave them a timetable. He said, Jesus is going to return and take the believers. Then the day of the Lord is going to come. Now, what happened? Some of the people in Thessalonica decided, man, life is so bad. Persecutions are so bad. I mean, uh, they're after Christians. They're killing them. These judgments must have become, begun. And the end of the world is right at hand. Boy, that's exactly what we were talking about a little bit ago. There were some people in the church at Thessalonica who had decided, hey, I, I know what Paul said, but it's clear that these judgments are already taking place. I mean, I don't know if they set a date or not, but they said the Lord is going to come. And he's going to come soon, and at, by soon I mean tomorrow. And it is so soon that I'm going to change my behavior. And here's what happened. Um, although people understood that Paul taught they were exempt from these judgments, they decided that they were going to stop working. Turn over to chapter 3. You're in, Second Thessal or in 1 Thessalonians. Go to chapter 3 of 2 Thessalonians, and here you're going to see the embarrassing problem that we run into. Because some of these people decided that the judgments of God had already started and the day of the Lord was at hand, and that Jesus clearly was going to end the world and they were done, here's what they did. Chapter 3, verse 6. Now we command you, brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you withdraw yourselves from every brother that walks disorderly and not after the tradition which he received from us, which ye received from, from us. Now, let me stop there and mention that word tradition. Sometimes people will say, oh, tradition. You mean like tradition is we always have the church service at the same time. Tradition is we wear a, a suit and a tie. Tradition is that we have a Christmas party. No, that's not what he's talking about. When he's talking about tradition here, he's not speaking of it the way that we think of it at all. This was my pre previous t uh, teaching that has become known to the church. This is the, the, the traditional understanding of what I taught you. You remember when I was there in person, I taught you the Lord was going to come? And I taught you the whens of it and how it was going to take place? Then I wrote it down for you. That Jesus is going to come, then the day of the Lord is going to come. And if you've got people who are not following that understanding, 
you need to withdraw yourselves from those people. Because those people are not living according to biblical truth. Go back to chapter 3, verse 6. Withdraw yourselves from every brother that walks disorderly and not according to the tradition or the teachings which you received from us. For yourselves know how ye ought to follow us. For we behave not ourselves disorderly among you. There are some people that are being disorderly, and that's not the example we gave you. Verse 8. Neither did we eat any man's bread for naught or without paying for it, uh, but wrought with labor and travail night and day that we might not be chargeable to any of you. Now, make sure you understand what Paul is saying. When I was there preaching, you know, and I'm the Apostle Paul, when I was there, I worked. I didn't have people feed me. I paid for my bread. I paid for my food. I didn't sit around expecting people to take care of me. Now go on in verse 9. Not because we uh, have not power or we not, don't have the right. We could say you need to do that. But to make ourselves an example unto you to follow us. For even when we were with you, this we commanded, that, it would, that if any would not work, neither should he eat. For we hear that there are some which walk among you disorderly, working not at all. They're leading an undisciplined life, but are busybodies. And he's going to go on to deal with that. And from everything we can understand, here's what had happened. There were people in the church who misunderstood, and I think more likely, and we're going to prove this as we go through, more likely misrepresented the teaching that Paul had given them. And they said, hey folks, we're in the day of the Lord, and Jesus is coming back. And since Jesus is coming back, we might as well not work because we're going to heaven. And so we can just give up our jobs, we can live off what we have, and if we don't have enough, we'll live off, the rest, we'll live off yours. But we're going to sit around and just wait for the Lord's coming. Because He's coming, folks. And boy, it sounds spiritual. Jesus is coming. And He said, nope, those people are walking disorderly. We told you when we were there, if you don't work, you don't eat. And now you've got people in your church sitting around not working and expecting to eat. Well, that's embarrassing, isn't it? You've got people who have misunderstood or misrepresented Scripture so they can do what they want to do. People are really good at manipulating Scripture this way. And the result was that some of them stopped worse working, and now we've got a really embarrassing situation. We've got people whose testimony is embarrassing in our community. Why are you acting like that? I don't even want to claim you as a church member. And yet you think you're doing things that are right? And Paul said, hey, we're going to have to correct this. And so when we get into uh, 2 Thessalonians, he's going to start in chapter 1 just saying, hey, I'm thankful for most of you and I want to encourage most of you. But in chapter 2, let me be real clear on what I said about the day of the Lord. And then in chapter 3, he's going to go to that group and we're going to come back to these verses in chapter 3 and he's going to reprimand them and then exhort them. You cannot behave like this. You know better than this. And behavior inconsistent with Christianity. When you looked at these people and they were not working but expecting to eat, that's inconsistent with Christianity. And he said that's the key to discerning misunderstood or misrepresented Bible teaching. When I see the way you're behaving, when I see what's happening, there's just something that I say, wait a minute, there's something not right here. I often think of Exodus 32. As, as uh, Moses is coming down off the mountain and, and they, they hear the noise from the camp. And Joshua says, ah, it sounds like war. And here's what Moses said. As soon as Moses came near the camp, camp, that he saw the calf and the dancing. And Moses' anger burned. And he threw the tablets from his hand and shattered them at the foot of the mountain. He took the calf which they had made and burned it with fire and ground it to powder and scattered it over the surface of the water and made the sons of Israel drink it. When he came down, he looked at that group and he said, I see 
behavior that is inconsistent with the holy God that I serve. He didn't stop to say, what are you doing? He just saw, you cannot act like this. That kind of behavior does not fit with biblical Christianity. And there are times when you have to come to the place where you say, I see that. I see that there are times that I interact with people whose behavior or their choices betray that they have misunderstood or they're misrepresenting Scripture. And it is incumbent upon you at that point to investigate and respond properly. When you see that, you don't just say, well, okay, whatever. No, I, I may have to go get some help. I may have to talk to the pastor. I may have to get some books out. I may have to open the Scripture and read. But, but boy, when you sense that isn't right, from what I know of Christianity, when they're not working and expecting to eat, something isn't right. And Paul was saying, you are correct about that. They have misunderstood or misrepresented Scripture. And there are times when people will do that and intentionally. They may even be deceiving themselves, but they're doing that. And you as a believer have to be one who says, I've got the Holy Spirit living in me, and I want to make sure that the Holy Spirit is guiding my understanding of things. And when I see somebody whose behavior or choices betray that they have misunderstood or are misrepresenting Scripture, I'm going to investigate that and make sure that I respond properly. And Paul said, I'm going to be really clear. If you're not working, you don't eat. And you withdraw from that guy. When we get to chapter 3, I'll tell you what that means. But you are the one who's right. And even if they make you feel like uh, by their spiritual speech, Jesus is coming, that, that they're okay, you have to look at them and say, it's inconsistent with what God is teaching. And I can't be a part of that. And Paul was going to be really clear and give us an example of how to respond to a situation like this. All right, let's bow for prayer, and then we're going to finish there for today. And with our heads bowed and out of courtesy for others, I'm, I, I didn't give a salvation message today, but perhaps today you are struggling to know your relationship with the Lord. When we finish here in just a moment, we're going to play through a stanza of a song, and as we do that, Pastor Rogers will be in the back of the auditorium. If you need to talk to somebody, please feel free to do that. We'd love to show you how you can know for sure that you're on your way to heaven. Then as a believer, maybe there's something in your life and you have to say, I have misrepresented or misunderstood Scripture, and it was to excuse my behavior. And maybe there are others that you're interacting with, and you need to, to develop the courage and say, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to be part of that. And I trust the Holy Spirit will guide you in responding properly to God. Let's stand together, please. Now, fathers, we stand before you. We know that your, your Holy Spirit will illumine us, and you'll help us to know what we ought to do and ought not to do. And so give us that help as we yield to your Spirit to be able to know what is right and know what is wrong. And Lord, I pray that you would bless as we finish the service by drawing people close to you. Now with our heads bowed, as Nancy plays through a stanza of a song, would you just take the time and pray and say, Lord, here's what you've taught me today, and here's how I'm going to respond. Thank you. You can look this way, please. And as always, if you have questions, please feel free to ask 
We'll be happy to talk with you about it. In just a moment, we're going to be dismissed, and most of you will go to your discussion group now. Each group makes their own plan, and so I know that there's actually at least one group that's going to have their fellowship next week because of the number of the people that are not here. Uh, but your discussion group fellowship will be next. If you don't know where you are, there are papers here, and they're out in the foyer. It has the, the groups and the, the room number, so you can look up here or look out in the foyer. Uh, but we'll have those, and then remember, we do not have a 6 o'clock service uh, this evening. All right, thank you for being here. You are dismissed.